The Astronomy of the Bhagavad Purana, Single Part Summary Version. Another name for the Bhagavad Purana is the Srimad Bhavatam, and we're focusing here on the fifth canto, chapters 16 to 26, with translations and commentary by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Now, within mainstream science, the common perception of the universe is essentially based on observable matter. In contrast, the Vedic scriptures describe a universe teeming with life. But this life, though beings with bodies, not limited to gross matter that we can actually perceive. These superior beings of the Puranas see the world around them in quite a different way. For example, they could see a big city in three dimensions in this example, but we may see the same thing in a more limited way, like in, say, two dimensions. Now, both views here are true and valid in their own way, but the Bhagavad Purana describes a multi-dimensional worldview of the celestial beings. That brings us on to chapters 16 and 19, Description of Jambaduip. Now, Jambaduip is essentially a system, a pattern of various mountains, in the center of which is this huge cone-like structure, gold cone-like structure called Mount Samaro. These mountains are all on a single island surrounded by an ocean of salt water. Now these mountains mark perimeters of various heavenly realms which have pious and godlike inhabitants. In the south there is Bharat Vash, which corresponds with ancient grain to India, or sometimes the whole world itself. Here's a, a side view of Jambadweep and its various oceans, and here is a topological map of Jambadweep, with the black lines there representing the mountain ranges, and the blue lines being the rivers. More about that later. So where and what is Jambadweep? Well, Sadaputta Das, alias Dr. Richard Thompson, uh, concludes there are four basic models here are represented within this part of the fifth canto. They are links between the earth and heavenly realms, those huge heavenly realms, the earth plane, and the center pivot of our solar system. Now, within chapters 16 to 26, there are a number uh, of various facts and figures uh, represented here by red dots. Each red dot is relevant to two or three of the models. Now, there is some crossing over between those models where some descriptions are relevant to more than one model. I suggest that it's showing connections between everyday sense perception and a multi-dimensional universe of the celestial beings. First model, links between places on Earth and the heavenly realms. So let's first of all focus on the Central Asian region here, particularly the mountainous regions. Let's close in. And here you go, close up here, and just note the, uh, the, the area of mountains here marked by the red circle and the various countries. Now then, we put in, um, make this a topological version of the same thing with the black lines there, the tops of the mountains. Compare that to the topological map amongst, uh, of Jambadweep, and we actually get um, a large similarity. So in one sense, this model is indeed valid. Of course, in, indeed, according to that same model to the south is Bharat Vash, which is ancient grain to India. But Badafash can also represent the whole world itself. This is because thousands and thousands of years ago it's believed that India was actually the centre of a huge cultural and political empire which spread across the whole civilised world. Model 2, as the heavenly realms, which are huge. Now, looking at the dimensions described in Yojanas and converted, uh, converted into miles in the Bhagavatam, they really are very, very, very tall mountains indeed. In fact, um, according to the scale of the Earth here, they're about, some of the mountains are about eight times the height of the Earth itself, which is absolutely incredible size. Looking at the same thing from the side here, here's the whole of Jambadweep, and just on the right side here, according to that scale, is our little Earth. Just see how big Mount Smero is in comparison. So with these dimensions, there are trees and mountains described as being thousands of miles high. According to this scale, then, here's an image of Lord Shiva, an extra banyan tree, and... Compared to the Earth, well, Lord Shiva would be as lot the size of a European country like England. A huge, huge difference in scale. The third model, as the Earth plane in stereographic projection. We need to familiarise ourselves with astrolabes, an ancient instrument uh, used for measuring time and navigation, especially when travelling on the seas and observing the stars. These were certainly used in um, the ancient Persian Empire and possibly in the Vedic times themselves. In astrolabes, the Earth was represented as a fat planisphere. Now here is the Earth in stereographic projection as a planisphere itself. This doesn't mean that the, uh, the ancient Vedic priests thought the Earth was flat like this, but rather this was a convenient way of travelling and navigation. 
Now, the planisphere model of the Earth here corresponds with verses in the Bhagavatam which describe the hottest annual path of the Sun upon the Earth's surface. This is called the ecliptic. In this model, then, Jambudweep, and here in its surrounding rings, is essentially the Earth in stereographic projection. This model places Mount Smero at the North Pole, as you can see here. But the features of Jambudweep and the Northern Hemisphere of today do not match this model. So obviously the placement of Mount Smero may be more relevant for another model. Chapter 20, the structure of the local universe, with the fourth model here, with Jambudweep as the centre of our solar system. So looking a bit further out now from Jambudweep and its surrounding salty ocean, there are other rings here, rings of various heavenly lands and oceans. Altogether, it's called the Plain of Bumandala. So we'll look at, learn more about that. We're going to look at the top now of Bumandala here. Right from the top, we can see a series of concentric rings of various oceans and mountains here. Now, about the 7th the or the 8th ring out, we can actually see the path, the orbit of the Sun around the Earth. More about that in a while. Now, Sadaputa Das, Dr. Richard Thompson, makes comparisons between the plane of Bumandala and our familiar solar system. Uh, this is particularly when converting distances of these various concentric circles, converting them from the ancient Yojana uh, measurement to miles, and we get a, a huge comparison. The main difference the, between the Vedic conception is that the Earth is basically put at the centre of the solar system, and indeed the universe itself. This is called geocentric. However, this is actually just simply a matter of relative motion. It's a relative point of view in space. For example, let's say two bodies in space, one larger than the other, but as long as the larger one is also moving somewhat, then of course it's relative point of view who is orbiting who. Now, let's look at our solar system, the heliocentric versus geocentric views. This is a heliocentric view here of uh, Earth and Mars orbiting the Sun. Now, let's make it geocentric. Here we have, of course, in this situation where the Earth is at the center, the Sun, of course, is doing its normal um, perfectly circular orbit this time around the Earth. But look what Mars does. Even though Mars is essentially trying to um, orbit the Sun, actually it's not in this model from the point of view of the Earth. Both views, heliocentric and geocentric, are relatively true in their own way. Now, with this geocentric pattern, with the Earth at the center, this is the ge geocentric epicycle um, path of Mercury. And adding the um, cycle of the Sun there. This is Venus. We get some lovely patterns here. Geocentric orbit of Mars. Add in all the inner planets here, and you get quite a beautiful pattern, actually. Of course, this can take you right out to the geocentric orbit of Jupiter. Now, uh, amazingly enough, looking there at the inner and outer edges of Bumandala, described here, it corresponds very closely, in fact, with the measurements of the inner planets of the solar system here. And in fact, the same thing carries on and applies to the outer um, planets of the solar system as well, corresponding with the outer rings of Bumandala. For example, geocentric orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, and even Uranus. Chapter 20, the structure of the local universe with links to heavenly realms. An interesting uh, character, uh, as prominent uh, king, is Maharaj Priyavata in the Bhagavatam. Uh, it seems his royal descendants occupied heavenly realms accessible from the inner solar system region, as we just learned. Uh, they had various different oceans and mountains. The heavenly regions accessible from this solar system include Plakshadweep and its ocean, Samaladweep and its ocean, Kushadweep and its ocean, Kwanshadweep and its ocean, Sakudweep and ocean, and Pushkaradweep and its surrounding ocean. Looking at the planet of Kushadweep, it has uh, Kusha grass flames that give it a mild and pleasing brightness, aids the nighttime growth of grains. It has an ocean like Ghee, a demigod realm ruled by King Chandra, and elevated souls live there for 10,000 years and enjoy life by drinking Somaras. Of course, this looks similar in some ways from the outset um, to our familiar moon, but of course this is the point of view of the celestial beings who can see things we can't. For example, they indeed see the moon as a place of cushy grass and places of uh, uh, plants and mountains and so forth and people and people drinking summer ass and having a great time. But from the modern gross point of view, indeed, perhaps the moon really is just grey dust in craters. Significantly enough, perhaps, uh, this dead planet view corresponds quite closely with the Vedic version of the planet of Rahu. 
planted plaxa tree, includes a huge plaxa tree that shines like gold. Residents worship the sun god and follow the four varnas of society and has an ocean of sugarcane juice. Somali Dweep has a huge Somali tree which is a residence of the divine Garuda. They worship the moon god and has an ocean like liquor. Now, based on the geocentric orbits of Venus, Mars and Mercury, these have relationships with links to Pushkaradweep, Sakradweep and Kwantradweep here. And of course they have their various mountains and characteristics of their population and heavenly realms. Now in the terms of Quantridry, we understand that the vegetation there was destroyed by Kartikeya, who of course is the god of war in Hindu uh, philosophy. OK, we've had a look at the intersection of the solar system and Bumandala. Now let's take it out a bit further to the outer regions. And there you have it. And you can see here the geocentric orbits of uh, looping epicycle orbits of Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus there. Now, as we get outside of the Mars orbit, we get an inhabited region according to the Bhagavatam. This corresponds, of course, with Ceres and the other asteroid belts. Then we get Jupiter and its moons, and close to the another one of the concentric orbits of uh, Bumandala rings, Saturn and its moons. So let's have a closer look here at the orbit, at the realm of Jupiter and Saturn. We're closing in now. We're going to close in to Jupiter and have a look at this realm known as the Golden Lands. So here we are, uh, close now to uh, the plane of Bermuda, looking at Jupiter and Saturn. This area here um, is known as the Golden Reflective Lands, not habitable for humans. So that includes um, Jupiter there, just on the inside of the Golden Land, and just on the outside, of course, is Saturn. And just beyond the geocentric orbit of Saturn is Loka, Loka Mountain, beyond which the naked eye from the Earth cannot see any planets. So looking again at Bumandala from the top here, here is the uh, circular Loka, Loka Mountain. Um, now beyond that, of course, is a Loka Vash in the Bhagavatam. And this is a near darkness from the point of view of the naked eye. can hardly be seen and there's no life there. The outer region of Lo a Loka Vash is the geocentric orbit of Uranus. Now a slight change of attack. Chapter 21 of the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, Movements of the Sun. Now as aforementioned in one of the models is actually the Earth in stereographic projection here. And this yellow line here represents the ecliptic path. The Earth, of course, one of the things that is responsible for the various, uh, seasons of the Earth is that the Earth is slightly tipped when compared with the plane of ecliptic. The plane of ecliptic, of course, being a straight line between the Sun and the Earth. And where that straight line hits the Earth here is represented by the yellow line. But we can see the Earth is slightly tipped here, so that, for example, in um, the winter, the Earth is tipped away from the Sun, and, of course, in the southern hemisphere, in this diagram, it would be the summer. And this the same thing from the other side. The annual orbit of the Sun around the Earth, this, of course, is called the ecliptic path. And there we are. Um, this is, of course, the course of a year, and this is also corresponding with the flat plane of Bumandala, as described earlier. Looking at, of course, other rings, not only just the orbit of the Sun here, but various other rings, we get to um, the fact that demigods maintain order daily and annually within the boundary of Masana Tara. So we have demigods like um, Indra, Yamaraj, Varuna with cities along this place here, and Soma. They maintain order and the seasons. And the, uh, the, kind of the annual orbit of the Sun here around the Earth is represented here by a huge chariot wheel representing the, the seasons throughout the year. Looking again here, of course, at the um, orbit of the Sun with the Earth at the centre, in the Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 21, 3-5, it describes the Sun's annual movement through the zodiac. This includes duration of the day increases, and when it, and of course, it declines, and the longest night, the shortest day of throughout the year here, and, of course, tracing out the Sun signs of the zodiac throughout the year. Chapter 22, the orbits of the planets, the vertical dimension. Again, looking here at the Bumandala here, just slightly more from the side again. Now, interesting enough, as before, uh, we you know, throw in a few planets there for good measure, of course. We made a link, didn't we, between the, the Bumandala, of course, here, and there's another link here with another model. This is the um, astrolabe. Now, in the sun's orbit of the astrolabe, which is uh, described here, there's a slight height above the, the, the bottom of the astrolabe, which is, represents the flat Earth. This again, notice that 
even in the vertical dimension, the sun is just slightly above the plane of the mandala here. This introduces us to the concept of the vertical dimension. Now, even though looking at the physical side, uh, we're calling it, of course, the solar system dimension, perhaps the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about 100 million miles, and yet the Sun is not exactly um, precisely on the plane of Bermuda, but very, very slightly above. In this, it's actually just 0.8 million miles. Now then, let's tr try to understand this a bit more. We add in the Moon. In this situation, the Moon is physically, you could say, very, very near to the Earth when compared with the Sun, but its orbit actually ends up being higher than the Sun when compared with the plane of Bumandala. The Sun is bound to be close to the plane of Bumandala because it's based on the ecliptic path. So this is not dealing here with physical distances. Um, when we talk about the heights of the planets, it's how much uh, the planet orbits away um, from the plane of Bumandala. The vertical dimension of subtle space travel. So here's the Earth again here, and tracing out the, the divine region, as mentioned before, in the area of Central Asia. Now, celestial beings, empowered holy people, can see uh, perhaps the huge, huge mountains of Jambudri, perhaps you saw. So they're connected to the Earth, but are not of the Earth, because they're much too large. Now, let's back off a bit here, and we can see, of course, the huge uh, place of Jambudri and Mount Smeril here, and there's the little Earth there to the right. And the understanding is we go inside the Earth and we go down, we can access the lower planets. However, if we travel up the direction of, uh, pointed out by Mount Smeril here, this is the path of the demigods, which, if you take that path, can lead you to the sun before, uh, or the sun rays before actually getting to the moon. So sometimes people say, well, I according to the Vedas, the uh, moon is nearer than the sun. Actually, what it's saying is the moon uh, is higher than the sun, when compared with the plane of Bumandala. But this vertical dimension is relevant in subtle space travel. Of course, as you go past the Moon, the various other planets are there as well with, with their heights. Taking it about a bit further, including other uh, planets of the inner solar system here, Venus, its height, Mercury's height, and Mars's height. Note this doesn't contradict um, modern astronomy. If we take it a bit further here to um, accommodate Jupiter here, we can say that all the planets have their various heights above the plane of Bumandala. But notice they're all, compared with the overall size of Bumandala, they're very relatively close here. Looking at it from the side here, just to get a, a general idea, we can see actually uh, we're introduced to the Garbodaka Ocean, which lies underneath. There's a bit of a gap there between the Earth level and Garbodaka Ocean. There. This, of course, is where um, if planets fall into this, then they are essentially at their embryonic stage where life cannot exist very easily. Now, underneath, between um, the plane of Burandala and the Garbodaka Ocean, is an area called the Lower Planets. There they are. And above, having a look now, um, past the height of Jupiter and Saturn, we get other planets, as well, sorry, we get other stars rather. We're adding in their local local mountain, which we cannot see past nor can we see at the lower planets from the point of view of the Earth with the naked eye. We reach the Seven Sages, sometimes known as the Plough. And throw in a few more stars for good measure, and eventually we get to Druvaloka, which corresponds roughly with the Pole Star. Now between Mount Smero and the Pole Star, or Druvaloka, we get the area known as Bhuvaloka, residents of advanced humans, Gandharvas and so forth. Chapter 23, the Shishamara Planetary Systems. Now, imagine you're actually on the Earth now, and you're looking up towards the Pole Star. What would you see? Let's say here's uh, some uh, various star constellation here, with the Pole Star, Druva Loka, represented in red. Now, of course, throughout any given night, of course, we would see that all the stars um, revolve around the Pole Star. Now then, in this chapter, we understand that there's a constellation here, known as the Shishamara, the Dolphin Constellation. This is most visible around 790 BC to about 1000 AD. Chapter 17, Descent of the Ganges. Here, of course, you can see uh, Lord Vamanadev uh, piercing the top of the universe here with his transcendental foot, from which the Ganges, the uh, transcendental uh, spiritual water called the Ganges, flows out into this mundane universe. And it makes its way to the Earth in the following way. Again, familiar ourselves here, of course, with the, uh, the vertical dimension as described earlier. So first of all, the Ganges, of course, goes by the Pole Star, Druva Loka, past the Big Dipper, or the Seven Sages, and it makes its way to the Moon in various celestial spaceships and Vimanas. 
and from the moon it makes its way to basically the top of Mount Smeru. Let's learn more about that. So here's the Ganges here going onto the top of Mount Smeru. We can see there's various cities and so forth on there. We're closing on that. Now in the centre here of, of the top of Mount Smeru there's Lord Brahma's township residence surrounded by the various cities of the demigods, Yamaraj, Soma uh, and so forth, Indra. The Ganges splits into four. One of those, of course, goes all the way down the side of Mount Smeru until it reaches the head of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva blocks that, uh, that, that, that impact, otherwise the earth itself and other realms would be destroyed. And there's Lord Shiva there uh, receiving the Ganges water, and at this point, when it reaches the Himalayan mountains on the earth, it becomes visible to our eyes in gross matter form. Or is it actually not actually gross matter? The Ganges is, in fact, a highly spiritualized place, and millions of people in India, even today, of course, bathe in the river to cleanse their sins and it has a purifying effect. Chapter 22 The Orbits of the Planets Part 2 The Vertical Dimension Reminding ourselves here of looking at the universe if you like from the side uh, the vertical dimension with the Earth, the solar system there the various stars including the Seven Sages or the Big Dipper and the red dot there representing the transcendental pole star. We're going to take this much higher up now uh, of course, including all the different uh, stars and planets and heavenly realms and so forth, uh, right to the top here of uh, the known universe uh, in the Vedas. Now, to give us an idea of scale here, the Earth would be about here, and the pole star we were learning about earlier, about here. So we're looking far beyond the pole star now. Throwing the uh, local locomotive for good measure, for which we can't see past, nor can we see underneath the lower planets. The sun's rays here, it's depicted here with a bit of uh, yellow light, enables us to see all the other stars in the sky. Looking now at the whole of the inner universe from the side here, we can see underneath just the bottom half of it is actually just the Garba Daka Ocean, the embryonic uh, stages of planets. Then we can see here the various layers, different planetary systems here. And within those realms are 400,000 different humanoid species including humans and demigods. Here we have Druvaloka, Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and at the top is Satyaloka. And after which is the beginnings of the coverings of this inner universe, which we'll learn more about for the moment. We'll learn about that later, but for the moment, let's go on a little spaceship, let's go to Mahaloka, and then we'll work our way up the higher heavenly planets to Satyaloka. Mahaloka is a great place of yogis and sages, a place of great, great beauty, where people will live for millions and millions of years by earthly calculation. Janaloka, again, a place where uh, great celibates and aesthetics are rewarded by entering this abode. Tapaloka, a place where people perform tapas, uh, that's great austerities, and it's a wonderful place for those, uh, very conducive for that meditation. It's also the place of the four Kamaras, where they live four uh, wonderful celestial beings and sons of Lord Brahma. At the very top is Satyaloka, the top of the material heavens, the abode of Lord Brahma. He people will live for hundreds of trillions of years in fact, after which of course they can potentially get liberated at the end of this universe if they live a devotional life. Now chapter 24 the subterranean planets now underneath Mount Smeru, or indeed of course underneath the earth, within the inner core of the earth, there are various various caverns according to the Bhagavatam, from which one can um, obtain the realms of Atalaloka, Vitalaloka, Sutataloka, Talatala, and so forth, like that. There appears to be links between the inner core of the earth and these lower planets, where the sun's rays cannot reach. Looking at those lower planets from the side again, here between um, Bumandale, there, the horizontal line, and the Garbhadaka Ocean are these planets. There's Atala, a place where heavenly prostitutes, or, or so-called heavenly prostitutes, lure men, of course, making them feel very sexualized and powerful. And yet, of course, at the time of their uh, death, they will have to accommodate for their karma. Vitala, a place where the beings, of course, live in great, great opulence here, wearing gold and living in beautiful palaces. Sutala is, is the place of Bali Maharaj. Now, Bali Maharaj used to rule the universe, but actually he renounced it. He actually ended up being a great devotee. So even though he lost control of the universe, and of course he was um, of Assyric demoniac descent, um, he actually was a great devotee, and he was rewarded with a nice consolation prize of the beautiful realm of Sutala. Tala Tala, this is the abode of Maya Danava, the greatest demoniac architect in the universe. Therefore, here you would expect to find great beauty, great... Uh, um, 
realms about more scientific advancement and a lack of spiritual advancement. But here they would know no disease, but here there would be wonderful, wonderful, impressive buildings and flying machines. Mahatala, this is a place where there would be uh, occupied mainly by demoniac serpents with many heads. I wouldn't fancy going there. Rasatala, this is the place of the enemies of the demigods where people live in holes like rats. And at the top, bottom here is Patala, the place of the Nagas, the serpent race. Again, they are very, very demoniac and cruel mentality, and often many of them have jewels on their heads enable them for them to see in the dark. Again, I wouldn't fancy going there. Chapter 25, The Glories of Lord Ananta. Beneath all these various um, subterranean planets, and indeed heavenly planets, sorry, hellish planets, is a huge multi-headed snake who's essentially holding up the whole, whole planetary systems here with his many, many hoods. Lord Nanta is worshipped by Lord Shiva himself, the deity of Tamagoon, or darkness. Therefore, Nanta is sometimes called Tamasi. Chapter 26, The Hellish Planets. The Hellish Planets here are just placed just above here, uh, Lord Ananta, in this diagram. Where is this? If you look, Actually, just between the lower planets and Garbodakar Ocean is the realm just above Above the Garbodak Ocean, just in existence, as it were, is the hellish realms. The king of those hellish realms is Yamaraj, who judges the sinful. People are taken in their subtle or astral body. If they live a sinful life, they'll be judged by Yamaraj, where they uh, receive punishments to fit various crimes. We'll spare the details of those, but it's not the nice place to go on holiday. This is all due to karma, and it's not forever. Uh, it's not an eternal hell, but whatever one karma is due, receives the various punishment before perhaps taking birth as an animal or uh, as a human again. Additional information here, aside from the, uh, in other parts of the Bhagavatam here, the size and coverings of this Brahmandala. This area here with the various planetary systems, 14 altogether actually, represents the Brahmandala as before described. We throw in here the planar Brahmandala. Um, and of course this here, as described before, corresponding roughly with the dimensions of the known solar system, 4 billion physical miles. Now the vertical dimension, here but represented by the y-axis, corresponds to about 2 billion subtle miles, as experienced by the demigods. Let's kind of go out here and look at the whole of the Brahmandala universe. And there you go, there's the 4 billion miles of the solar system. Now as we get closer to this part of the universe, we witness the densification of elements from Earth's point of view. As we go away from this area, we essentially go backwards in time, and this is what forms the layers uh, when, it, when it came to the um, building and evolution of the universe. We get to, for example, the first layer, ten times thicker actually. Each layer is ten times thicker than the previous. So first of all we have Earth. This is when solids are formed. Then we have a layer of water. Fire. Air. Ether. Ten times thicker, of course, than ether. The layer of the mind intelligence, and finally the uh, the largest of them all, ego, of course is keeping us conditioned souls within the universe in this way. Now, interestingly enough, this Brahmandala, described like a golden egg, um, is roughly actually the same size, roughly, about the estimates of our modern Milky Way galaxy. That's quite interesting. But what's beyond this Brahmandala universe? The answer is, well, others. We can see here Maha Vishnu here, a form of Lord Krishna, another form of who's lying in the great cosmic ocean here, half asleep, and is he breathing in and out, in and out? Millions of these Brahmandali universes are coming in and out of the pores of his skin. They are this is similar in fact in some way to the expansion and contraction of the cosmos, perhaps. So where's our universe? Well, just about there. And and of course here this is the personification of the material world is um some like Mahadevi or Drogadevi here. And when Mah Vishnu, in his half asleep mode here, glances at her, this glancing is actually all the conditioned souls here, and the, con the personification of that is Lord Shiva himself. So Shiva and Durga, in many ways, are the, the father and mother of this material world. But let's go beyond this material cosmos. Of course, this, we get a much, much. Uh, uh, a bigger realm here, of course, the, the material world, the cosmos being in the bottom right of the picture there. And we can see here this bluish region here called the Vaikuntha planets, which stretches for eternity. And there are many, many planets, spiritual planets, which have no beginning and no end. They are eternal abodes. Of course, the main planet is Galoka Vandavan. 
So let's explore these realms. First of all, let's go just between here. Uh, let's go into the, the effulgence. Let's look at the effulgence now, the white effulgence of Galoka Vandarvan. Outside the mature universe, but not far outside. And there it is. We call this the Brahma Jyoti, the impersonal Brahman, a place of, of, of relative uh, liberation, but where no form or variety is experienced. So one may be free from anxiety, but given that we're used to relationships and experience and form, we may not last here forever, and it's not entirely satisfactory. We may go back down again to the material world. What about here, the Vaikuntha planets? Let's have a look here. And in this place, the Lord, in the form of the Lord is Narayan form, is worshipped in great awe and reverence. A great kingly ras, a kingly relationship is gone here, where people live in great opulence with palaces, and then the males have forearms and so forth. But ultimately, uh, this sense of kingly awe and reverence is observed here. But is there something more than that? Can we have a closer relationship with God even than that? And the answer is yes, we can. And that's experienced here in the inner realm of Gloka Vandavan, the uh, uh, original and most powerful planet of all. And inside here we see Krishna in his two-arm bended form here, surrounded by the gopis. This, of course, is the Goloka Vandavan. This is the origin of all. The relationship between Krishna and his favorite gopi Radharani is the... Uh, original relationship of all between male and female. This is a place full of eternity, knowledge and bliss and the origin of everything. Krishna is the Supreme Personality Godhead and one without a second. And we have a simultaneous oneness and difference between his, him and his identity. Our constitutional position is to serve Lord Krishna and our goal is to enter this eternal abode full of bliss. Galoka Vandavan. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.